Hello, welcome to Collective Conscious, episode six out of infinity. Today is actually a very special episode because we've got my good friend, John, with us. John, how does it feel to now be an internet celebrity? Oh, wow, that's that's a lot of pressure on me all of a sudden. Yeah, man, you got to live up to the expectations, though. There's a lot of kids looking up to you, and if you do something wrong, you know, you don't want to be the next Kevin Spacey or anything like that. It's It's pretty high stakes. Yeah, so no, I would say just be careful. Yeah, I think I'm going to just delete my Twitter now at that. If this is what's happening. Taking Herm Edwards advice or maybe Stephen A. Smith's advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today what we are talking about is the concept of morality and specifically whether there exists any sort of objective component to morality or whether morality as a whole is an objective structure in itself. And so just to jump, jump straight into it, Jumwei, what are your initial thoughts on this? What's your thought process? Yeah, so initially my um, my answer is that there is no objective morality um, and that morality is pretty subjective for the most part. Um, and instead of giving like a broad abstract definition, I actually want to like, I want to actually first go to an argument that like considers a reason why objective morality is a thing. So I'm going to give like a kind of like some premises and then I hope I hope this argument is weak enough that we can like tackle it and like um prove that i guess objective morality isn't a thing so the argument goes as this um one tor torturing babies for fun is wrong which is like a pretty uncontroversial assumption two torturing babies for fun is objectively wrong three that means that there is at least one action such that it is objectively wrong and then four i conclude that there is objective morality um and i think there's actually a lot of problems with this argument which like that's why i wanted to um bring this up um so what do you guys think john i'll let you go first on that one um on it, i think that's a really interesting question because it, it, it's really hard to prove like i, I agree with jim way that it just sort of falls apart because to just make the statement to say that killing babies is wrong yes we know it's wrong because we have laws, we've been taught that it's wrong, it's always been wrong, but just the statement, killing babies is wrong, is just subjective at its core. Exactly, and I think for me, like, if you, the problem with this argument is that if you strip the words of their, like, cultural or biological connotations, like, for example, like, a baby isn't an innocent life, or, like, torture is not a vile act, and et cetera, and take the example to be in a vacuum, as in like a human being interacts with with another human being to trigger a chemical reaction, or even like more radically, like matter interacting with matter, then saying it's wrong holds holds no value. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Jinwei. In a cosmic sense, I think that gets at the question of whether there's a purpose to morality anyways in a cosmic sense, which I suppose gets at the question if life has any value in, on itself or any meaning, um, but we're not going to go that deep right now. Uh, but I agree, in a, in a grand sort of universal perspective, I don't think there's any such thing as right or wrong because it's just the laws of physics working their way out. I don't think that's the same exact question, though, of whether from a human perspective, there can be such a thing as a right or a wrong, if that makes sense. Because ultimately, we're really trapped in our own way of perceiving the world. And so does it really, does it really make sense to try to view things from the universe's point of view when we can never be the universe? I mean, we're stuck as humans. So is it useful to think of things from that grand point of view? Right, and I think if you think about it, about it at that point of view, that kind of just appeals to nihilism at that point, which is kind of, I mean, we can save that topic for another day, I suppose. Um, but I guess for the purposes of this discussion, we should focus on, you know, just like the intrinsic qualities of being a human, like feeling, and that definitely relates to it. Yeah, something that might be interesting to ask is, if you stripped away certain aspects of what a human was, would there still be a sense of morality or not? And I would say that if you stripped away certain seemingly unrelated aspects from morality from humans and morality still existed in some sense, then that 
that would indicate that there is a sort of objective morality. But if you strip away something like our capability of feeling emotion, and along with it goes any sense of morality, then to me, that would indicate that morality is probably purely subjective. No, that's definitely a good point, Tyler. And I feel that just morality is kind of part of the human condition. So to really strip that away would put us in a part where we just, you know, aren't like, would we be human at that point? Right. That's that's a great question, because it leads to the question of if morality is an essential part of being human, then wouldn't that mean it's in some sense objectively existing? Or would it not? Hmm. What do you think, Jumai? Can you like rephrase that in a different way? Sure. If all humans, by virtue of the fact that they are human, have a moral conduct and a moral code, wouldn't that indicate that morality must be an objective part of being human? I think from that wording, it might just it kind of might just come down to semantics because I think that even though you can argue that objectively there is there is morality, like how we view it in like from society to society, from time period to time period can can vastly vary. And I think there's um, there's a lot of case examples that we can probably like obvious examples you can probably point to that indicate that. Um, but I think like different people hold different like truth values to whether this thing is good or this thing is this thing is bad. That's true. There's a difference between all humans having a moral code and all humans having the same moral code. Right. Clearly, we do have differences, but I suppose the, the next piece that's important is to try to explore what is the origin of the moral differences between people? Is the origin purely people coming up with their own opinions about the world and how it should work and how people should act? Or is there something more out of our control that determines our different beliefs? I assume part of it is the environment in which we grow up. And I would, I would suspect that a lot of people would say that's all of it. But that just doesn't seem right to me that the only thing that determines your morals is the family or community you grew up in. Right. I think that your argument kind of, uh, kind of reminded me of, I don't know if you guys heard of Euthyphro's dilemma, which is like, is an act right because God says it is, or does God say it is because it's right? And then like, you know, either answer presents a lot of like problematic things that occur. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Wouldn't that just mean that God himself is just subjectively determining uh, by his opinion, what a, what is good and bad? Yeah, I think you're right, John. Let's replace the word God with nature and try it again then. So can you can you re restate it that way, Jumai? Sure. Is an act right because nature says it is, or does nature say it is because it's right? See, this this I think is actually interesting because I do so on its face, that doesn't sound like it makes sense, right? Because nature doesn't tell you whether things are right or wrong. But I actually partially disagree with that. I think that we are born with conceptualizations of specific actions that are right or wrong. And so I do think that nature can partly determine what is good. Um, wouldn't, in a certain sense, those um, kind of being born with this you know, sense of right and wrong, couldn't that just be sort of just an evolved sense of instinct? I do think that's what it is. I think that's part of nature, though. So, 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 is, so if instinct at its core could be like a sense of knowing what is a what is right or wrong or what you need to do to either survive or, you know, to fit in with society, then just being born with that would kind of mean that nature has that set path that is deemed good. That's pretty similar to the way I see it, actually, I would say. 
So what I would say is actually, let me start with this. How do we decide what we personally, so let's put aside the question of whether there's an objective morality or not. We can all acknowledge that people have different moral beliefs on an individual level, right? Right. Yep. So what is the origin of our individual beliefs? Do we just wake up one day and decide that a certain thing is right or wrong? Or do we have a framework with which we work and then make adjustments? So to me, it's it's much more the latter than it is the former, where we're born with this sort of framework that is not completely exhaustive, perhaps, but gives us the ability to make small adjustments to our moral opinions of certain behaviors, rather than being born with no opinions about those behaviors, and then having to form them ourselves or having people tell us whether things are good or bad. I don't think you need, I'll I'll put it in more concrete terms. I don't think you need the Ten Commandments to understand that murder is probably wrong. I don't think that needs to be taught. I, I, I would disagree and think it does need to be taught. Um, just kind of given, well, well, okay. Oh, so I, I was about to make the argument, well, it's kind of falling in on itself, but I was about to make the argument that like looking at, let's say African warlords with their like child armies, but you know, those children are probably, you know, they're just taught that killing is good, but you know, had those children not had any interaction, would they think killing is bad? Yeah. That's the thing. It's impossible to say for sure, but I would lean on the side of yes. And I, I definitely understand that someone would not think about it that way. But for me, I guess the key part of this is what I see as the purpose of morality. So let's let's talk about that for a second. To me, the purpose of morality is to have humans behave in such a way that society is as stable as possible, essentially. And specifically our own You can call them tribal groups, but I think a more accurate way of putting it is reproductive groups. Basically, the groups within which we have potential mates. So what do you think that morality standalone is basically the primary way that that we we want to survive? Like the that's the reason for morality. I think it's a method of organizing communal structures in a nonviolent way and i would say that so let's let's take other species for example right Mm -hmm. there are it, it has been shown that when a big rat plays with a small rat and i got this from a a speech from jordan peterson just for the record so when two rats are playing in a lab and one rat is, I think it's like just 10% more mass, it could win in a play fight 100% of the time, but that's not actually what ends up happening. What ends up happening is the big rat chooses to win about 70% of the time. And the reason for that is because if the little rat doesn't see the game as winnable or fair, it's never going to play. So I think there's even a sense of, and I could understand if you don't want to call it pure morality, I might not even call that purely immoral behavior, but I would argue that that shows evidence that the idea of fairness and morality is intrinsic. It's not taught. Wouldn't, um, I guess kind of looking at it from that sense, could morality just be the visualization or representation of our just like our empathy Mm, that's a really interesting question because it's just like um in in a sense then just born with that empathetic just kind of um view i guess thinking of an example i was just i want to sort of plug this example in because i think it's a little interesting like uh, the uh, kid who was raised by wolves, and um, I just think it's 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 fascinating because in a sense, you know, 
as a kid, he didn't really know what to do because he was too young, but he at least knew he needed to be part of this community, which so happened to be wolves. And I think learning with them, he really just kind of applied his mostly just his empathetic value and probably just took on some form of a moral structure within that pack. And I don't know, I just think at its core, maybe morality is just empathy. I mean, that goes That's a really to... interesting point. Go ahead, Jumar. I was going to say, that goes back to your um, original question, Tali, which is like, what happens if we strip humans of all emotion? Like, what happens to mor- morality then? Like, we still need to, um, I guess, go back to that central question, right? If we're talking about empathy. No, that's true. Right. I, Something yeah. that I, an important question if you try to equate empathy with morality would be, how do we account for the concept of justice? Um, so let me, I'll give a concrete example. You have a convicted murderer. You know he's a murderer. He, let's just say he, I don't know, raped like 20 people and then killed them and then raped them again or something. Uh, we're going to get demonetized off YouTube because I said that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's just say you have this guy that probably almost everyone in the world would consider a pretty bad guy, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, you have him in jail. All right. But the question is whether you give someone like that the death penalty or not. Okay. If morality is purely born out of empathy, I don't think anyone would argue that you should give him the death penalty. It just doesn't fully seem to account for the concept of justice. Empathy for the victims. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, I could see that. But the reason I bring up this example is because at that point, there is nothing that you could actually do for the victims. And you'd purely be aggressing towards the, the perpetrator. And I'm not trying to say whether he deserves it or not. That's, I'm not trying to like answer that question. It's just, it seems to me that you need more than just empathy in order to have that concept that he might deserve it. So I wonder if it's if it's not just empathy, but more so like the desire for societal well-being. Because there are definitely times where being nice isn't the best way to help someone or to help a group of people. Well, I, I, I honestly think that at that point, deciding the death penalty could just be like, a simple logic check just like okay he killed people in the community we are we we are empathetic towards the victims and their families um if we don't either put this guy behind bars for life or kill him then he will continue doing this in the community so we need to stop it now to prevent further you know devastation okay interesting um but then you're trying to prevent him from doing anything more to the community but i'm not convinced that that's fully the actual motivation for people who would say you know give him the death penalty like i'm not saying everyone would want that but for those who would i'm not sure that's fully the motivation it seems to me and maybe this is just a leap but that a bigger driver of that desire is the actual feelings of aggression toward that person. I don't think you can really have empathy without aggression. Like they, they require each other. Yeah. Just as like a, to insert a thought here, like if you take out of the full range of human emotion, if you, if you take anger out of human emotion, like do you think that person still would wish a, well, people will still wish death penalty on on like rapists or murderers. Like if you just take anger out, because it seems yeah, like it's a better way of putting yeah. it. Hmm. I think that sort of indicates that it's not just positive emotions that are quote good and negative emotions that are quote bad. I think both can be both. Like anger can be a very good thing if it's used appropriately. Wow. In self-defense, for example, or in defense of, you know, people around you in a real-time way, not necessarily ex post facto. 
I mean, I think without anger, we'd have a really hard time surviving as a human species. Yeah, that's true. I mean, anger is definitely more of a survival thing than it is a moral thing. Um, maybe that's true of all emotions, but definitely anger and aggression. Well, even without anger, wouldn't we still kind of, you know, just have that instinct and like fear for our own life? So we'd want to prevent ourselves from being around people that could endanger our lives? Yes, I agree with that. I think we'd probably just react in a different way. Like, it would probably be the flight side of fight or flight. Mm. Ooh, that's a good point. Yeah, maybe anger is really what enables us to fight. Although I would say fear is definitely another motivator for fighting. I mean, fear can be a motivator for fight or flight, but I don't think it just has to be a motivator for flight. Ooh. I'm not sure if there are any other motivators for fighting. But I mean, that also, it brings up the point of that anger toward one thing can be the same as love toward another. For example, um, a mother bear protecting her cubs is angry toward you. But the action is also derived out of love toward the cubs, arguably, when a, a mother bear, you know, tries to maul you. Yeah, I mean, so no, nobody, it's not like each action is one or the other. Yeah, I mean, nobody wants to shoot somebody breaking into their home, but, you know, they're scared for their lives. So they have to, you know, kind of protect their family. Yeah, I, I kind of see what. Yeah, that's no, that's a really good point. It's a really good point. Yeah. So I want to go back again real quickly to what we think the purpose of morality in the first place is. I sort of gave my answer, but I'll, I'll very quickly reiterate it and then move on to your opinions. I think that the purpose of morality is to uh, enable humans to establish consistently stable societal structures and that it was essentially bred into us through millions of years of evolution. So I'm, I'm assuming that you guys definitely have different opinions about the purpose or maybe the origin. So I'm curious what you guys think. Um, well, I would, I would definitely say um, that morality, well, that morality would be just kind of bred in like, I agree with it is as the idea that it is keeping together the society, the societal structure. But I feel the societal structure is being shaped around people with similar groupings of moral code. Like, the, the okay, yeah. structures are definitely going to be built within the society. And I agree that that, that as a way is going to sustain itself. So you see the causal relation reversed, essentially? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I can definitely, I can understand that point of view, for sure. What about you, Jumar? I think the answer is, for me, it probably has to do with a little bit of A, a little bit of B. Um, I think I agree with you, Tyler, that, like, you're, like, kind of, each person is kind of hardwired to follow uh, a certain moral code, so to speak. And then, like, I also agree with John that, like, growing up in a different society would allow one another, like, to a certain degree, to have to exhibit different, um, different, different, like a different moral compass, so to speak. Yeah, I suppose this kind of goes back to our second episode, Jimmy, about social norms. But yeah. part of the question is, just because evolution creates the framework for a moral belief system in a person, does that mean that it necessarily is fully responsible for it, or that it exists objectively. I'm not fully confident about either yes or no to that question. In my I mind, I would my, lean towards... Go ahead. I think my answer would be that one reinforces the other, and then, like, one can't exist without the other being prevalent. So, like, you know, evolutionary-wise, like, for morality, that can't exist without having, like, society, and then vice versa. Yeah, see, actually, that's a super important question, because can morality really exist without society? I think the answer is yes and no. It's not purely no. Um, 
is morality useful without society? Probably not. But I still think people would have certain moral beliefs without the existence of a society. Even things like our opinions toward animal abuse, for example. But even just taking away any other species, right? Just one human completely in isolation, no other forms of life. I still think they would have certain moral beliefs, maybe just with no way to describe them, given the lack of existence of other people to apply them to. But I still think that there would exist some form of behavioral code that the person follows. Because otherwise, what are we doing? We're just randomly randomly assigning good or bad values to things and then figuring out which of those work and which of those don't work. I think there has to be something more guided than that. I don't know. It all seems pretty arbitrary. <laughs> well, fair enough. I mean, you can see pretty big differences between different cultures, too. I suppose it would be the case that if each culture had some sort of moral structure that was completely universal throughout them, then that would probably be an indication of a sort of objective component of morality. But I don't really know what that would be. I mean, you can look at things like almost all cultures find incest wrong but I, I'm not sure I can say all cultures find it wrong because there might be some that don't see it as taboo. But something like that, I think, is a, a good example of one that's potentially not the highest stakes possible. But I think the reason people feel so strongly about it comes from the evolutionary origins of the belief in that the reproductive viability of incest is much lower and so that's an explanation for why we feel so negatively toward it and view it as morally wrong. And so extending that logic to other beliefs, I view them roughly the same way, although not all of them have as clear you know, lines from evolution to the belief itself. So do you think that morality like is purely a human construct and that like other like you need this level of intelligence to be able to fully comprehend the idea of morality and right and wrong? Or do you think that this can exist below humans as well with other, other species? I don't know. Do dogs look guilty when they break stuff in your house? <laughs> That's not actually my argument, but <laughs> um, I think that other species don't have probably the intelligence to understand morality, but seem to still act in accordance to a type of moral structure. Like, actually, I'm not sure if the mother bear protecting her cubs is the best example, because that's just survival. But I do think there are actions that other species take that could be considered in some sense moral without them actually understanding it. I mean, we do things like that we don't understand all the time. So you don't have to fully comprehend something in order to have it be a part of you. That's a good point. So, I suppose that what I would say, I guess, is really that there are probably pieces of morality that are sort of extraneous to the evolutionary origins and more just artifacts from the wiring that we are given, but it really does seem to me that the foundations of our moral code are more so evolutionarily derived than not. And there could be, there could definitely be things like maybe, uh, what, what's a really small example of something? I don't know, like holding the door open. I don't know if that could even be considered a moral belief. That's more just a politeness thing. Wouldn't that be derived? But, like chivalry which was kind of a moral belief yeah is chivalry considered a moral belief? i guess it could be yeah yeah i, thought I think there's a pretty clear i think there's a pretty clear line between chivalry and evolution though just through the fact that it's essentially all about reproduction <laughs> i mean that's really what chivalry is is just 
it's purely just rep uh, like we're not the only species to have a concept of chivalry obviously it, it's pretty common for that sort of gender relationship in sexually dimorphic species so i think i'm i'm sort of repeating the argument that i made in the second episode where i just view evolution as the cause of everything we do <laughs> And it seems like emotions play a big part in that because, you know, just going back to your incest example and why we have this kind of literally hardwired belief about incest is wrong, incest feels bad. And there's obviously this sense of disgust that humans have. Um, and then, it, you know, this this concept is actually called, um, I think, it's, I believe it's called moral dumbfounding um, because there's this like example where, you know, let's take two people, Julie and Mark, and they're like, they're like, camping and you know they're having their brothers and sisters and they're like over the age of consent they're it's like they're using a condom she's using birth control and everything's right right and there's but they're still having sex and like even when you ask people like what's wrong with that people can't really give a straight answer and which is why it's called moral dumbfounding but like there's some sense like you just have this weird feeling in your body that like that feels wrong even though like there's really objectively like nothing wrong about it it's just two people who want to have sex right but at, this, at the end of the day it's like no matter what you say to people they have this like kind of fifth sense that like you just you don't there's something there's something wrong there even though they're not really doing anything wrong yeah so maybe morality is just something we use to explain our actions more easily even though it has nothing to do with them at their core maybe it's just an easy way to interpret them and to interpret other people. In which case, I actually would argue more that it's subjective. If morality isn't actually the basis of those, what we would consider moral opinions, and morality is actually just something that we put on top of them in order to explain them more easily, then I would actually consider it more subjective because it's just a label at that point. It's not the derivation of the opinion itself. It's just a mask. But it's hard to say. I think the incest example is uh, is really interesting for that reason, though, because logically, you could say essentially the argument that I made that the offspring is it, it's less reproductively viable. But no one goes around uh, justifying their actions based off reproductive viability, <laughs> <laughs> or at least nobody that I've met. I don't know about you guys. Not yet. <laughs> it's a uh, hack. Yeah. So we're reaching a pretty decent time. So I want to get a chance for us all to have some closing thoughts and maybe a way that we can each sort of apply the way we individually conceptualize morality to a way we can behave in the world optimally. Yeah. I don't want to say behave in the world right because that's a moral statement on it in itself. But I'll I'll start with you, Jim Wei. Um, what do you think we can take away from this? Um, I think that with just morality considered, it seems that like you can go towards like a, as you said, like no one really takes like a reproductive like offspring approach. That seems really uh, not just doesn't feel right um but i think if you take the wide range of human emotions and um kind of going back to last last episode which is like if you feel something that's like wrong in your body and like like a tightness of a chest because you're you're anxious or you have a lump in your throat because you feel fear i think like my answer would just come down to like experiencing emotion and that like what how that changes the way you think and that's like a very broad answer, but I think emotion dictates a lot of the things we do. Yeah. Do you think that's for better or worse or neither? Uh, probably lean towards towards better that we just we would have to we can't survive without emotions. Yeah, fair enough. I agree with you for the most part on that for sure. What about you, John? Um, yeah, I would definitely, definitely agree with uh, Jim Way on this one. But um, I would just like to make 
just add that um really I mean I, I definitely just have to agree with you Tyler too that it, it definitely feels from an evolutionary standpoint this is where it's deriving from so you know just as humans we're, I mean we're just going to we're just going to keep having this moral code because that's just what we do it's just part of our instinct it's part of you know the human condition so I just don't think it's you know, for better or worse, it's just what we have. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there's any way to escape it, even if we wanted to. Even nihilism doesn't really let you escape it because you still have to behave in the world. You can't just do nothing. Yeah. I mean, you can try. But yeah, I would say that my, my sort of takeaway point would be that you shouldn't let people convince you of something purely on moral grounds because morality the way we interpret it can definitely be manipulated and the origins of it i don't believe were given to us by some sort of transcendental being or anything like that they don't they don't necessarily serve a a supernatural purpose or that there exists any sort of universal right and wrong that they're just rules that evolution came up with in order to allow people to survive and reproduce. And so you can listen to them or not, but they're there for a reason. So they shouldn't be ignored. They just shouldn't be blindly followed either. That would really be my closing thoughts on the matter. So for Collective Conscious, this has been episode six, Objective Morality. Thank you, John, for joining us for this one. It was it was pretty interesting to have another person in the conversation, I got to say. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. See you next time.